There we go. All right, well, welcome. Uh, great to have uh, great to have you uh, here this evening. I also uh, welcome those that are watching on um, on the live stream. Uh, my name is Drew Desker. I'm the director here at uh, Copernic. And uh, for those watching on the live stream, you can actually uh, you see we've got uh, some public here. You all wave to everybody <laughs> in YouTube land. Um, really excited uh, about uh, tonight's program. Um, uh, very often people will, uh, once or twice a week, somebody will call up and say, hey, you know, can we come up for a, uh, uh, a tour? And, you know, as long as we don't have something else going on at the same time, happy to oblige uh, that. And um, so earlier this summer, um, Pete uh, happened to be in the area and uh, came up. And uh, when I found out what he did, I said, all right, we, ne we need to talk. But um, before we get into Pete's presentation, um, just a little bit about Copernic. I just um, let's let me turn this back over here again to the public. Um, by show of hands, who's here for the first time? All right, great, super, super. By show of hands, who is a member? All right, almost <laughs> the other side of it. This is great. Um, so the people who raise their hand first. I want to point out that people that raise their hand second uh, know something very valuable, and that's the, the value of a, of a Copernic membership. We are a nonprofit uh, public observatory. We don't get any you know, government money, or we're not associated with any particular uh, you know, university. So what keeps our doors open and keeps these programs going are, you know, like your admission. Uh, we do get uh, some grants from time to time to do some programming, uh, some, some donations, but for the most part, it's um, – you know, also memberships that uh, help, uh, you know, keep keep uh, us doing what we're doing. Uh, a Copernic membership is for a family is just sixty dollars a year, and uh, what's particularly useful about a Copernic membership is that we belong to a, a facility called uh, the. Um, actually, I want to make sure that I'm actually got audio here, I'm going to the live stream, and I do. Okay, good. So they can hear me. <laughs> so um, we belong to uh, a consortium of nonprofit of, of uh, science centers called the ASTC, Association of Science and Technology Centers. There are over 350 of them throughout the uh, the U.S., and they will honor your Copernic membership to get in for free. So you could get into Roberson, you could get into the Museum of Science and Technology up in Syracuse, or the Franklin Institute in Philly, or the um, uh, the Intrepid down in New York City for free. And uh, plus, you get into any of our Friday night programs uh, for free. Among the things also that we do is we offer uh, programs for, um, for students. We have a very active uh, summer camp program. We had over 200 students uh, over, over this past summer. They came up here. And coming up in uh, November, we have a special program called Girl Power Science. And it's really uh, it's aimed at girls that are between like third and eighth grade and really trying to encourage more women in STEM careers. And one of the things that we do with this is we always have um, a, a female engineer or scientist talk about the work that they do. And a number of years ago, we had a, uh, a female astrophysicist who works actually at the Goddard Space Flight Center um, we talk about the work that she's doing, uh, looking at carbon dioxide levels and you know using satellite data to do that. And then after her presentation, the girls get to ask questions because it's a video conference. And one of the girls asked, how did you get interested in astrophysics? And I loved her answer. She said, well, when I was in college, I was an English major, but my boyfriend was a physics major. We would go from observatory to observatory. I eventually dumped the boyfriend, but I kept the astronomy. She now has her PhD in astrophysics and works at the Goddard Space Flight Center. So you never know where a seed's going to get planted, and that's really sort of what, what Copernic's all about. So these Friday night programs um, were – yeah, we're fortunate to be able to sort of be able to do them in person again. Uh, the, the YouTube streaming is actually something we had to do once the pandemic hit. We wanted to keep that public engagement going, and we started our YouTube channel. We now have over 2,500 subscribers. And, um, but the purpose of these programs is really give you an opportunity, give the public an opportunity, just to learn more about the world and the universe and how things work. Uh, it's not always about astronomy. Uh, today happens to be about you know, you know, uh, space exploration. Uh, next week we'll have a, a talk about um, uh, trying to move away from uh, uh, 
fossil fuel, you know, uh, what, what's the future hold for us uh, in future, you know, uh, with respect to, uh, you know, energy uh, production that does not include uh, fossil fuels. Uh, the week after that, we'll be doing, uh, uh, a uh, professor will talk about uh, rocks of New York State. So if you've got a, a rock that, you know, in your yard that you don't know quite what it is, bring it up and he'll help you uh, uh, figure out what, what what's going on there. So, um, uh, What's also nice about our live stream is that you know they are all all of these programs are now stored on our YouTube channel, and so you could come back if you missed if you missed one of our programs, you can actually go to our YouTube channel and uh, look at it for free. If you are watching on the YouTube, um, down in the uh, comments section below, there's an opportunity to, to help support the uh, the live stream by by donating. So if you're in a position to do that, uh, we would appreciate that. So anyway, let's. Uh, Let's move on to why you're all here, and that's uh, to learn more about uh, uh, mission control. Uh, again, Pete uh, was up here this summer on, uh, I'm assuming, on vacation, and um, uh, uh, had a, a, just a, a lovely opportunity to, to meet with him, talk with him, and uh, and I said, I got to know more about the work that you do. And um, so um, uh, instead of bringing, mission con bringing us to mission control, uh, he's bringing mission control to us. So. Uh, Pete, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself. Maybe tell a little bit about your background, where you came from, and um, and what you do. Sure, sure. All right. So, uh, greetings from humid Houston, Texas. Uh, and you can all see the the screen I'm sharing. You can see my presentation. Okay. All right. Yep. Uh, so awesome. my name is uh, Pete Morgan, and uh, I was on vacation up in the southern tier. Uh, I'm originally from Maryland, but spent a lot of my summertime. Uh, vacations up at a, at a lake uh, in the general area of where you guys are now. And so we, we came to see the observatory, and, and one thing led to another, and, and here I am again. Uh, and, and so I have degrees from the Florida Institute of Technology, and I'm working on a degree from the University of Houston. And uh, I'm a flight controller down here at the Johnson Space Center, uh, working on the International Space Station program as well as the next moon program which is something that's never happened in my life. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. And so uh, this presentation is mostly just going to be of some anecdotes, uh, of history of NASA, what I do. Um, it's not a canned, rehearsed presentation. I'm just talking to you, trying to humanize um, what goes on in this building that you see before you. Uh, we're all people, and, and we love what we do. And so, so there I am uh, doing the thing. Uh, I am part of the Pluto team, which is a sort of made up acronym for the Plug-in Plan Utilization Officer. Because uh, way back in the day, early space station days in the late 90s and early 2000s, my group was in charge of managing all the power outlets on the space station, which kind of seems silly, but um, the crew's busy, and you don't want somebody to plug something in and fry themselves or the equipment, especially when they're in space and you can't get to them to fix it. Uh, but our group eventually evolved, and, and now we, we still do a little bit of power management. But our primary concern is essentially all of the computers and all of the computer networks on board the space station. So think about anything that you use your computer for at home, and then add a bunch of random space stuff to it, and, and that's what we, what we manage. And so this is where I work. Uh, currently I'm at home because of COVID, and... Uh, I haven't actually been into the office in almost two years, but we still do go in to fly the space station. And so this is this is where we work. And there's a few things I'd like to point out to you guys here. Let me go ahead and pull my pointer up. Okay. Yep, we can see it. It's on okay, the mainstream. Oh, there it yeah. is. Okay. Um, so this is during the actual, speaking of women in, in STEM and girls in STEM, this is actually during the all-female uh, spacewalk. Hang on, there's my pointer. Let's try that again. And so you can see here, um, we've got Christina and Jessica out doing their thing. And the whole point of mission control is that the crew is so busy keeping themselves alive and doing science and fixing things and, and pushing the boundaries of what humanity is capable of they don't have time to actually fly the spaceship themselves. And so for each of these people you see, they are managing a system on the ground so the crew doesn't have to. Because you can imagine you've got six people up there usually, um, 
it would take way more than that to be able to fully automate and manage this space station. Although I have some news about that in the future. And so each person you see here, um, you've got the flight director here. And there are two flight directors on console because it's an EVA. One is in charge of the space station and the other is in charge of the EVA or spacewalk. EVA is extravehicular activity basically outside the vehicle. And then you've got the Capcoms. And they're the ones that actually talk to the astronauts. Because you can imagine how cluttered and confusing it would get if everybody in this room was trying to talk to one of the two people all day long. And so all the messages are sent through the Capcom. And that keeps everything clear and level-headed, and you can talk about what's going on, and everybody knows what's going on because you're listening to it on your headset. But this isn't the full story. For each person you see in this room, there is anywhere between one to, I don't know, five people in another room somewhere in the building helping them out. So, for instance, we sit over here right out of camera view, and our job in this seat is to take the information from our system and see how it connects to and affects and integrates with everybody else's system. But in our ear, we have a helper too. And they're in the back room, and they're the ones that are really digging down into the technical details. And they're the ones that are hyper-focused on just what we need to know. And then they tell you what's going on in your ear, and then it's your job when you're in the front room to figure out, okay, when is a good time to talk about this? How can I bring this up to everybody's attention? Is it even important enough to bring to their attention? And so it's quite the job. Uh, lots of communication involved and uh, it's very fast paced. So uh, this is the flight control room. This is one of several that we have. And you can see up here on the big board, we've got where the space station is. Uh, here we've got a bunch of videos from the space station and the spacewalk and the cameras on the crew's helmets. Up here we've got a bunch of timers and clocks about what's going on, how long the crew has been outside, when they need to come back inside. And then we've also got some, some video up here along the top Usually, that's video from our international partners. So there are other mission controls across the world, um, in Japan, in Europe, um, even uh, Alabama. We work very closely. They take care of all the science and payloads on board the space station while we actually fly the space station. So it works really well. And usually, we'll have cameras from those control rooms looking around up here so we can, we can see what the people we're working with are doing so we don't interrupt them if it's something important. But that begs the question, um, why have admission control at all? Well, uh, so back in the day, back in the early 60s, this was what your spaceship looked like. And um, computer technology is pretty great right now. Uh, it's getting better every day. But it still takes an entire room full of people and computers to manage a spacecraft in this day and age. Uh, so you can imagine in the 60s what the computers looked like and how big they were. And there was no way ever that they were going to fit into this capsule that was so small it was almost like wearing a suit instead of being in a vehicle. And so that's how the, the concept of mission control got started with a guy named Christopher Kraft, who he himself um, referenced mission controls from test pilots in the 40s and 50s. They would have people on the ground monitoring all the computer systems, not computer systems, but all the flight systems, so the pilot could fly the plane and not worry about the other stuff. And people on the ground would take care of all the technical details. So that was evolved into mission control. And it's a concept that's still going on strong to this day. Um, but these tiny spacecraft didn't last in, in the 60s. Uh, of course, we had the directive from Kennedy to go to the moon. Uh, it is, in my opinion, the greatest human achievement that we have done as a species. Uh, and we are about to repeat it again for the first time in my lifetime. So that's very exciting. But uh, in eight short years and with enough money, we went from these spaceships to flying the biggest rocket that to this day has ever successfully flown. Uh, the Russians had a larger rocket that it blew up on all of their test flights, and it's the reason they didn't get to the moon, because eventually they gave up on it, and the Soviet Union collapsed, and they never went. And so for half a century, the United States is the only country that has ever put people on another world besides Earth. And I think that's, that's fascinating. I think it's more fascinating that it happened half a century ago, and it's long overdue for happening again. But here we are. From eight years, we went from something that you could fit into your pickup truck to something that is so big, you have to build the building around it uh, to, to basically protect it from the weather. And in this picture, uh, yours truly is there at the top right 
this is about 10 years ago when I was hired with a, a new group of flight controllers were all brought in at about the same time. And um, only about half of us are left. Uh, nothing against them. It's not our job for everybody. Some people want to do more design work. Some people want to do something a little more laid back. Some people want to not feel uh, under the pressure of talking to a flight director, and that's fine. It takes all types. But only about half of us are left from this group. Um, but we have new people brought on every, every year, and, and they love it. So, uh, and when I say this rocket is big, I mean this rocket is big. This is, this is the size of the Saturn V that took us to the moon. Um, you can see the engines on the left, they're so large, it's hard to get them into a single picture. Um, you can see these rockets, actually, there's three of them that were never flown, because funding was cut, and essentially we couldn't afford to launch them, and so we kept them. And you've got one in Florida, you've got one in Huntsville, Alabama, and you've got one here in Houston. And if you ever find yourselves in those states, highly recommend you at least go in and take a look. Let's see here. Okay. So um, this is the rocket that we use to take us to the moon. And at, at first look, this slide looks like a, you know, just a bunch of nothing. But this is actually the scale and distance from Earth to the moon. You know, we always see it, and they're right close together, and the moon is like half the size of Earth. It's like, that's not that far. No, it, it's really far. This is, this is a true scale representation of how far we have gone from our home. And um, if you've ever seen Apollo 13, which once upon a time everybody had seen that movie, but, but that was about 30 years ago, so it's due for a rewatch if you haven't seen it. Um, when there was an explosion on the spacecraft, they were almost all the way to the moon, and it was the mission controllers that got them home. The crew was focused on essentially not freezing to death and dying. But that let the mission control team work through the problem, bring in hundreds of people, think through it step by step by step, and that is that is exactly why we're there because there's just too much going on in any spacecraft present day that the people on board the spacecraft are so busy with science and the direct you know exploration of it that they need a, a support team, and, and I'm lucky enough to be among those uh, in the support team. And so here we are on the moon. Um, I actually believe this is from Apollo 17, which was 1972, so 49 years ago since we've last walked on the lunar surface. And there's something I want to point out about this picture. The, the lander looks huge, right? You see the guy in the moon buggy, which is like the size of, I don't know, a little bit bigger than a smart car, a coupe, it's a little sports car. Uh, and it looks like the lander is enormous, but that's a trick. And this is why some of the moon pictures look strange. There are no points of reference. There are no houses. There are no trees. There are no dogs. And so you can't tell how far away something is. So is that moon buggy really tiny and really close? Or is it really big and really far? And it turns out it's somewhere in between. Um, if you look at the two landing legs of, of the lunar lander, the rover is about the distance between those. So I'm going to go ahead and pull my annotation thing up here again. And so this here, uh, if it was actually as close to the camera as the lander is, it would take up about this area. Uh, but that that's one of the reasons, and I'm not going to get into it today unless anybody has questions about it at the end of which case I'd be more than happy to. Um, some of the moon conspiracy type people will point out that the photos look weird, and they do, because there's no points of reference. The light is very harsh, and you can't really tell how far things are or if the terrain is level or not. And so it's a fascinating fascinating story of, of psychology and photography, and there's a bunch of YouTube videos on, on how you can get pictures that look like this, and it's fascinating. So if anybody is curious, uh, feel free to ask me some questions at the end. But you don't get that on Earth. Uh, the other thing you don't get is a black sky during the day. Um, and it's weird, it, and it takes a little bit of use to think that you can be surrounded by blackness, but it's not dark. Um, and the moon is actually quite bright. I mean, if you've ever been out on a beautiful full moon, which I think actually tonight or last night there was a full moon, um, if you go out and look how bright it is, you can see shadows, you can, you can cast light, and you can you know, sometimes even read a book by it. So imagine you're actually standing on it. Imagine how bright it would actually be if it was the ground beneath you. Uh, and so it's, it's a fascinating, almost romantic 
adventurous place to me because it's so close, but it's so far and it's so alien. You can look up from the lunar surface and see home. You can see the Earth in the sky, even though you're in one of the weirdest places imaginable. I think that's fascinating, and I'm super hyped that finally we've got the political will and funding together for the last four presidents have, have all played a part in the current state of NASA. And hopefully in the next several years, we will have people back on the moon. And, and hopefully this time it will be a permanent two-stay situation. And that will become the new normal. And, and we will have pushed our horizons outward. And so this is the room where all the magic happened. This room is directly above the room that I work in. Uh, the pillar on the right, labeled H14, runs all the way down through the floor, and I sit right in front of it, and I bump my chair against it all the time, and it's um, in an irritating location, but it's there. And uh, this is this is the state-of-the-art, bleeding-edge state-of-the-art technology that got us to the moon. And, and if you look at the big board in the center, you can actually see, again, two-scale Earth-Moon connected by a line that follows the, the path of the spacecraft. And no one has been able to do this in the half century since, either due to funding or more likely just due to lack of will. Um, it's, it's an honor to, to be a part of the next generation of people doing this, and it's an honor to look back at what they were able to accomplish with what we would today consider extremely rudimentary technology, which at the time was just unheard of. I mean, computers, the computers that we're using now, smartphones, are an absolute 100% direct result of the technology that was invented to get us to the moon, and it trickled down into society, and our lives would be completely different without it. But one of the coolest parts about this photo is that it's still there, and you can actually go see it. Uh, you can go to Space Center Houston, which is the privately owned visitor center across the street, and they'll take you on a tour, and you can go in, and, and this is the real deal. This is not recreated. This is... The original consoles, the original footage, the original posters, they did have to repaint because, you know, 50-year-old paint. But it's the same paint. It's just a new layer of it. I like the fact and, that there's a, uh, yeah. a pencil sharpener there. Yeah. <laughs> they When they were restoring this, um, previously it had, it had been open to anybody at NASA, and I had a, a badge and so did a thousand other people. You could actually just swipe in and wander around. Uh, well, after 30 years of that, uh, it was in pretty poor shape. Um, it was it was loved too much, uh, and I say 30 years, not 50, because fun fact, we started flying the space shuttle with these same consoles. So these consoles lasted from the mid 60s all the way through the mid 80s before they were finally upgraded. Uh, so it got a lot of use. Uh, I bet um, I bet that's a rotary phone on the left as well. It is. It absolutely is. Um, and it, it's fascinating when they're restoring this. They put out a call to NASA, if anybody like, hey, you got any old weird office chairs in your office, or you got any old paperwork, because stuff gets saved, and it, it finds its way to your possession. And so there's essentially um, a, a donation drive of people at work who, if they had anything from the era, old headsets, whatever, they were asked if they were willing to, to essentially donate them to the cause and put back where they originally came from. And so you go in there, and... Um, there's a whole presentation. There's a viewing room just to the right of this picture. You can see these big, big windows. And they dim the lights. And they talk about Apollo. And then the consoles, one by one, will light up. And they will play the actual recording of Neil and Buzz landing on the moon. And the person who's talking, wherever they were sitting, there will be a spotlight that lights up that console. And you can see how the whole room comes together to achieve humanity's greatest endeavors ever. And it's about a five, ten minute long presentation, and then it cuts to Neil Armstrong coming down the ladder, and they bring up the video on the screen, which you can see here. Um, and it's like it's like being there in in July of 1969, except it's you know 2021 or was before before COVID closed everything down. Um, highly recommend it though, if if you ever find yourself in Houston for whatever reason, you can you can spend several hours doing this stuff, and you you get a better appreciation for where you come from or where we come from and, and and what can be accomplished when people just work together. And so um, I will skip over Skylab. Uh, Skylab was our first space station. It was put into orbit between the end of the Apollo program and the beginning of the shuttle program. Uh, we also had our first mission with the Russians in that same era. Those were more or less one-off missions. 
and I honestly don't know as much about those as I do about the stuff that happened before and after. So we come up into the shuttle in the early 80s, and again, we're still using those same consoles. And the shuttle, the shuttle was a romantic, wonderful, beautiful, elegant vehicle. Um, it was designed 40 years ago to be reusable, the first spacecraft ever to be reusable. Um, it looked like the spacecraft should. It had wings. It didn't have parachutes. It was elegant. It was beautiful. Um, unfortunately, it turned out to be quite expensive um, and very complicated because, again, they were really pushing the bleeding edge 40 years ago. But it doesn't mean it was bad. The space shuttle could do things that we still can't do today, things that no spacecraft flying today can do, and that was take up huge amounts of cargo, um, release satellites, grab satellites, bring them back to Earth to be fixed, and then sent back up. Nowadays, we can't do that, and that's okay. Things change. Um, but the, Hub the, the space shuttle saved the Hubble Space Telescope, which has unlocked our understanding of the universe and our place in it, because it, it launched with a mirror that was just like one fiftieth of a human hair too thin, and uh, it, the pictures weren't any better than what you could get on the ground. And without the space shuttle, we wouldn't have been able to. Um, we wouldn't have been able to fix that, and it would have been a waste of money. But it wasn't. And then, so the space shuttle leads into the International Space Station program, which is where I work. And I'll talk about that in a second. But I would first like to share this video of a shuttle launch. And if it's laggy for those of you online, um, I've got at the top left of the screen the keywords you can type to to watch it yourselves. But I, I was fortunate enough because I went to school in Florida uh, toward the end of the space shuttle program that I got to see 12 shuttle launches from about three miles away. And I had friends who worked there in internships. And three miles is as close as you want to be because it gets really loud and really dangerous if you're getting closer. And if you get too close, the, the shock from the sound can actually kill you. So generally speaking, not a good day. But this is a video that I found that um, essentially captures what it's like to be at a shuttle launch. And uh, it works best with headphones if you crank the volume up, essentially so you can feel it, because that's what it's like in real life. And it sets off all the car alarms and, and the air around you shakes. But this is about a four minute video that I'll play for you. And um, notice how the shuttle engines are ignited. Um, they're hydrogen fueled. And so hydrogen is extremely flammable so which is why you need it in the shuttle, um, they have sparklers that come on because hydrogen will build up around the engines and when you ignite them, you don't want a giant fireball around in, on your vehicle. So they have sparklers that burn off the excess hydrogen and, and you'll see that in this video. And it goes from countdown to liftoff to solid rocket booster burnout and, and then the shuttle is on its way to the space station. All right, here we go. Oh, yeah, let me make sure I'm sharing my sound here before we... I am, okay. T minus 90 seconds and counting. All systems are good. We're about 90 seconds from the launch of Space Shuttle Discovery. T minus 60 seconds and counting. We are transferring to orbiter internal power at this time. Discovery is now running off its three onboard fuel cells. Coming up on a go for auto sequence start. And we have a go for auto sequence start. Discovery's onboard computers have primary control of all the vehicle's critical functions. T minus 17 seconds and count. 15. 12. 11. 
So that is a space shuttle launch, and um, our new moon rocket, the SLS, uh, is actually based on the space shuttle. And uh, coincidentally, down at the Kennedy Space Center, we finished building it today. We put the Orion capsule on top, and we're looking at a test flight sometime early next year. Uh, no people on board, but uh, we're going back to the moon. And then a year later, we'll put people on it, and, and that'll be that for the first time in, in my life. So let me get back to presentation. Yeah. All right. So here we go. So the space shuttle was used to build the International Space Station. And uh, it is international. Uh, NASA is the lead on it. Uh, so we get mostly the final say about what goes and what doesn't. Um, the Russian segment is a little bit autonomous as well. And that's something to be pointed out, is that the space station started out as Space Station Freedom during Ronald Reagan's presidency, um, around the same time that the Russians were planning the Mir-2 space station. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, neither country wanted to fund their own space stations. And uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, it was feared that some of these Russian rocket scientists might be unemployed and might start looking for jobs at countries that we didn't really like. So we decided to invite them to participate in our space station project. And the International Space Station is literally, not figured, like an actual true statement, is the near two space station with modifications attached to the back of the Freedom space station with modifications. So the front and back halves look very different and they operate very differently, but with enough goodwill and political will and money, um, and actually, it's, it's not that expensive, all things considered. Um, you can make that work. You can you can have two former enemies come together to build a vehicle that serves all of humanity. And that's one of the benefits of NASA that is often overlooked. It's the cultural exchange. It's hard to hate somebody when you work with them every day. And that is super important to just the world in general. And moving forward, it will become more so because it's... It, it's cliche, but there are no borders in space. You are just a group of people trying to do what's right for humanity. You all came from the same place. You all came from Earth. It's our home, and you're just trying to survive together and, and do your best, regardless of who's the president or who's in charge or who's in Congress, because those things are fleeting. Um, but knowledge is not. Knowledge 
endures and knowledge continues. And as elections happen and come and go, um, we are still up there working together. So here's an up-close view of it. The actual picture is, is enormous, huge, huge picture. This was taken, I believe, um, from a space shuttle. On the way home, they would do a fly around of the space station, and the people in the space station would inspect the space shuttle, and the people in the shuttle would inspect the space station to make sure everything was okay. And so this is taken by one of the astronauts out the window. Uh, and you can see the Russian Soyuz spacecraft, the little um, greenish um, round thing sticking down out of the bottom. And, and the whole thing, I'll be told, is about the size of a football field, including the solar panels. And a lot of people say, oh, it's wasted money. Oh, why are we doing this? We could be feeding the homeless. We could be feeding the hungry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the answer is we do all those things. Uh, and it's important to be able to do more than one thing at a time. Um, this is a service. This is not intended to make money. This is intended to unite people, to inspire people, to create jobs so that those people can feed their families and send their kids to college and be productive members of society. And it's the third brightest object in the sky, or fourth, I'm sorry, after, um, no, it is a third. It's, it's, of course, the sun and the moon, and then you've got the space station when it flies overhead. And you never know what kid is going to look up at that space station and get curious about the world around them. And maybe they won't go into space, but maybe they'll go into technology, maybe they'll become a doctor. Who knows what they'll come up with. Actually, as it turns out, if you get up tomorrow morning here in the southern tier at 620, the space station is going to fly directly overhead. Do it. So when you <laughs> if you guys are up at 620, it will look like a very bright white star, and it will just silently glide across the sky. Just, it, it's not an airplane, it doesn't blink, and it's not fast, it's silent. It's just a beautiful, just arcing motion across the sky. Um, and so that's all the benefits we get in terms of, like, you know, feel good uh, community and inspiration and emotion, which is part of being human and is important. Uh, the tangible benefits are it is a jumping off point for a lot of companies who want to do private space flight. Um, it allows them to test new technologies in space. It gives them a, a toehold to grab onto so that they can participate. And those companies likewise employ people and have inventions and make their lives better. It's a test bed for going back to the moon and Mars. Uh, it's my personal opinion that the ultimate survival of humanity uh, revolves around two things, and that is renewable energy so that we don't run out of resources and exploration so that if something terrible were to happen to Earth, we would have a backup essentially. Uh, it, it's not as far-fetched as it sounds, and I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, but given enough time, you're going to want a second home for everybody. Uh, and a lot of medical research. The big thing they do on the space station is a lot of medical research, and that's because your body acts weird in zero gravity. There's no, there's no force pulling down on you to keep your muscles and bones strong, so they get weak. And so if we can understand how and why they get weak, we can use that for medicine that treats things like osteoporosis. Uh, another thing that's happening is your blood shifts because, again, there's no gravity pulling all your blood down into your lower body. It fills up your head and your face, and it can cause problems with people's eyes. And so that was a problem we didn't even know existed until astronauts started coming back with eye problems. And so now we're studying that. And, and again, if you understand the body that you live in, by putting it into weird situations and circumstances, you, who knows what you can learn? And then you can bring that and take it back down to the planet, essentially, and help everybody around you. So if someone's suffering from osteoporosis or, or arthritis, you know, there, there are treatments that are coming out of what we've done on the space station. Um, and so, so I'm not so much involved with the science of it. Like I said, we, our control center in Houston flies the spacecraft. There's another control center in Huntsville, Alabama, and they do all the science. And I know hundreds of papers have been published out, out of the research that have been done on the space station. So I'm not the, I'm not the authority on that. Um, but it is, it is very applicable to Earth. Like, you know, it's expensive, but it's not like we're launching the money in space. The money is being spent on Earth, and the knowledge is being shared on Earth. Um, and we also do a lot of looking down. Uh, with, with climate change and, and just even, you know, monitoring the harvests or just taking beautiful pictures of our home to remind us where we come from. Um, this is a picture of New York City, and you can see Central Park and, and Times Square. Um, 
It's been said that the only man-made object you can see from space is the Great Wall of China, but as you can see, that's not true. You can see a lot of things that people have done on Earth. Um, you can see fishing vessels. You can see buildings. You, you can see cities. Um, if you zoom in far enough, you can probably even see cars. I don't know if you can see people yet. But, uh, you know, it, it reminds us where we came from. It's no coincidence that after we went to the moon, um, you got organizations like Doctors Without Borders, and that's when Earth Day was proposed. Because, you know, if you're able to remove yourself and look back where you came from, suddenly it's like, oh, wow, like, I didn't realize what I had. Uh, and so a lot of that impact is just, just looking back at home. And so like this, this looks like it's out of a science fiction, but no, this is, this is where we live. This is our home. Um, you can see the stars in the sky. This is the space station flying over the northern lights because they're actually higher than the northern lights, so they look down on them. And this is just before sunrise. So you can see the sun is just starting to peek over the limb of the Earth. And you can see the thin atmosphere that keeps everybody alive. And you can see the northern lights, and then you can see everything else that exists. It just the vast, I don't want to say nothingness because it is everything, um, just the vast ocean of space and time before us. And again, Another beautiful picture taken by one of our astronauts looking down on Earth. Uh, you can't see any borders, you can't see any people, but we're there. And, and that's our home. That's, that's where we come from. And, and the history of everything has occurred here. Dinosaurs, Abraham Lincoln, you and me. It's all occurred on this tiny speck in space. Uh, so space is not out there and detached from us. We actually exist within space. And it's, it's important to understand that to kind of change your perspective on life and, and what matters and what doesn't and, and how to take care of things before, before they're gone. Um, so I don't want to get too preachy. <laughs> uh, and I have another video for you guys this time. It's in the presentation. Um, one of the coolest things is if you're sitting in mission control at night and the, well, it's, during the day, but the spacecraft goes in and out of night because it travels around the Earth uh, once every hour and a half. So they'll come in and out of sunrise. Uh, and if they happen to be flying over a thunderstorm, you can actually look down and see the entire storm and see lightning flashing below them. And so this is what it looks like to see a thunderstorm from space. And it's funny. If lightning has ever struck a tree near you, it's huge and imposing and powerful, and it's scary and it's big. Um, but from this perspective, it looks like Christmas lights. So it's it's really all about your frame of reference here. Like fireflies as well. Like fireflies, yes. That's more that's more eloquent than, than what I said. So, so uh, that's the current state of affairs. Uh, the presentation time over here. I do want to talk about commercial space flight because that's been in the news a lot, and I want to give you guys a heads up on what's going on with that, what it might mean for you and me, and then um, I'll have some time for some questions. Okay. All right. So perhaps you've recently heard about uh, Richard Branson or Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, um, and they have been belittled for, shall we say, squandering money on space flight. Uh, I feel it is important to remind people that that is how commercial airlines started as well. Uh, expensive joy rides for those who could afford it, and now you can hop on an airplane and be in Europe in, you know, six to eight hours. So who knows what the next 60 years will bring. you got to start somewhere. I have, however, heard some people say that is the future of space flight. And I feel like that might be disingenuous. Personally, I'm not speaking for NASA here, uh, because there is suborbital space flight which is where you get in a rocket, you go up, and you come down. And it's profound and it's amazing because it took the entire country to be able to do that to send Alan Shepard up, you know, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, and now you can have private companies doing that. So that is a fascinating change. Uh, the fastest you get doing that is about uh, 2,300 miles per hour. How do you do orbital space flight? Uh, such as SpaceX actually just sent up uh, four people and they came back on the Inspiration4 mission, or if you want to go to the International Space Station, you essentially have to go so fast that by the time you fall back down to Earth, the Earth has curved away from you, and so you just end up going in a circle. Uh, think of it like throwing a baseball so fast that the curve of the baseball matches the curve of the Earth, and it just keeps going. So in order to do that, 
you have to travel over 17,000 miles an hour, which is why rockets are huge and why they're full of fuel, because that is really, really fast. It's fast enough that if you got on a rocket where you're sitting now and wanted to go to Los Angeles, you'd be there in less than 10 minutes. So this is like extremely, it's, it's hard to explain how fast that is. Um, and so when the rockets go up, it looks like they're going up fast and high vertically. But what they're really doing is they're just getting out of the atmosphere because that'll slow you down. 90% of their speed is actually sideways. So they go up and they turn and then they just, they just go uh, faster and faster and faster and they drop their spent parts um, to lose weight. Once they're done, once the fuel tanks are empty, they drop them and go faster and faster. Although that might be changing. Uh, SpaceX is working on a giant rocket that doesn't uh, need more than two stages to get into orbit. They're actually working on it down uh, in Texas, a few hours south of me, uh, and they're part of the Artemis program, so that'll be cool to see how we work with them. We are not in competition with SpaceX. We are uh, basically partners with SpaceX. And so that gets us to the second um, commercial space flight thing that's happening on, and that is uh, commercial resupply. And the idea behind this is that we know that private companies are more cost effective and faster moving than NASA can be. They don't have to respond to Congress. They don't have their budget messed with every year. They can set their course and stick with it. And so the idea is that NASA hires and already has, hires different companies to fly our astronauts to the space station. And you want to hire more than one company. So if, if company A has a problem with their rocket, you can put your people on company B's rocket and, and vice versa. So you get dissimilar redundancy. You don't want everybody on the same rocket. If something goes wrong, well, shoot, now you've got to take apart all the rockets that are able to fly and make sure the problem's not there. So uh, this also expands the envelope. You know, there was the, the Mercury 7. So of all the people on the planet, seven of them had to go to space back in the day. Well, now we're up almost to a thousand people, I think, several hundred. And the more people that get involved, the more people will have that opportunity. The more people will be exposed to the world around us, the more people will have their view changed, the more jobs will be created, the economy will be simulated. You'll bring about a sea change in, in terms of industry uh, and and lead the way of humanity's next steps. You know, like like the explorers from Europe traveling to North America, right? Back in the day, you had to be an explorer. And now you just have to hop on a flight. And, and I've had friends work for airlines who've gone to Europe and back in a day. Um, and so you never know. If you get more and more people involved, you never know who that one person is. Just going to be like, hey, I got people that no one's ever thought of before. And it, and it could change everything. And uh, this is actually a picture of our partner, SpaceX, um, docking their crew spacecraft to the space station, which you can see in the bottom left of the picture. Um, and you notice you don't see any stars, and that is because um, it's daytime, right? Even though you're not on Earth, you're in the sun. And so the camera is set to very bright objects, because it is daytime, and you can't see stars during the day. So that's why you can have a black sky with no stars in it, because if the sun is shining, your eyes and the camera will be adjusted for the bright light of the sun reflecting off the things around you, and you'll be able to see. Let's see. Okay, here's another cool video. So um, the space shuttle was the first reusable spacecraft, uh, but SpaceX has recently started using their rockets. And so this is a video of, I believe it's currently the largest rocket flying until the new moon rocket comes online pretty soon. And what they do is they actually fly their spacecraft up, shoot the payload out, turn around, and land their rockets, which is hugely impressive. And it's in it's in metric, but I want you to look at the bottom left hand side of the screen to see how fast this rocket and this payload goes. Uh, and that's how fast you have to go to get into orbit. And so that kind of puts into perspective what kind of power we're dealing with here. So let me pull this video up. It's also about four minutes long. Okay. Share. There we go. All right. So what we've got here is we've got the uh, the Falcon Heavy, and it's got three boosters on the bottom. You can see them, a second stage and a payload. And so the boosters will go up, detach, fly back, and land, and the second stage with the payload will keep going in order. 
five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Under the power of 5.1 million pounds of thrust, Falcon Heavy is headed to space. Pico. This is a Successful separation, if you can hear me over the cheering. Side boosters now beginning a flip to begin returning back to Cape Canaveral. Miko. Main engine cut off, center core shut down. Separation confirmed. Here comes the fairing separation, and there it goes! Today, we'll be attempting to recover all three of the first stage cores, and all three boosters are currently on their way heading home. In just a few minutes, the side boosters will execute an entry burn, followed by a landing burn, and the center core will do much the same a few minutes later. Coming up in about five seconds here, the side boosters landing burn will begin as well. So again, as we mentioned earlier, this is going to be a challenging landing, one, and we are starting landing on our drone ship. Of course, I still love you. We have landed at the center for the first time on our drone ship, of course I still love you. For the first time we've landed all three boosters for Falcon Heavy. What an amazing day. Spacecraft separation confirmed. Right. And I want to point out um, that each of those rockets is like the size of a 10-story apartment building. Like, these, these are not like tiny little things. These are gigantic, huge building-sized vehicles that are flying through space. Um, I also want to point out that uh, SpaceX has their own mission control uh, for their own missions and when they're flying our crew. So we are not in charge of them, um, and we don't control their rockets. We, we have great faith that they will do the right thing, and so far they've really performed well. Again, personal opinion, not representing NASA. But, um, but they're the same people that launched a, a Tesla in space as a test payload to make sure the rocket works. So they have fun over there. And um, that being said, they are one of the commercial partners that we are going back to the moon with. Uh, so the idea is that we want to hand over the, the quote-unquote routine um, maintenance of low Earth orbit and space station resupply to our industry partners because they can do it faster and cheaper. Well, NASA, with some other industry partners, focuses on going back to the moon. And so here you have what is called the Lunar Gateway, and it is essentially um, a waypoint, some might say small space station, permanently in lunar orbit. And the idea is that you can use this much like the space station. You can have small companies that can't get to the moon on their own. They can use this as a toehold. They can really expand their horizons. And the idea is that you bring the Orion spacecraft, CMA, which is NASA owned and, and built by Lockheed Martin, and you bring the SpaceX or, or maybe um, Blue Origin 
uh, lander, hypothetically, because they don't have a contract, but they're trying to get one. Uh, you dock that to the, the gateway, and then you've got kind of like a little mini space station. Uh, and that can serve as a safe haven, it serves as a staging area, and then you get from your run into the lander, you go to the moon, come back, and, and everybody's happy. And so I'm, it's really exciting about that. And unlike Apollo, it's not designed to be temporary. Um, the, the presence of a small space station in lunar orbit really locks in how permanent we want this to be. It will always be there, and you can always visit it. You can always use it for rescue or for a test bed. So there's a lot of really cool stuff going on. Um, you can find tons of stuff about this on the internet. It's constantly changing. It's constantly evolving. But our first launch is coming up here in a few months, and so I highly recommend you watch that. It's the Artemis 1 launch, and we've been working on it for years and years and years, and it will be the first time a capsule um, has flown to the moon since 1972. So we're really, really excited about that and, and all the industry that we're bringing along with us. And so that closes out my presentation. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, if you're interested in a fun movie night or you just want to learn more, this is a list of my personal favorite movies and documentaries about space and, and why we do it and what we get out of it. Um, a Beautiful Planet and Among the Stars in particular uh, take place during my time at NASA, so it's kind of a glimpse into what's going on since I've been working there. Uh, Among the Stars starts off with uh, the Italian astronaut Luca Pomifano almost drowning in space, of which I was um, in the Mission Control Support Room for that. Um, he had a malfunction in his spacesuit, and it started blowing water from his life support backpack into his helmet. And of course, without gravity, it doesn't go anywhere, it just sticks to your face. Uh, and so that was scary, and it was a, a sober reminder of while everything we're doing is fun and exciting, uh, it can be extremely dangerous and it can go south really, really quick. Uh, so that was really sobering and luckily he survived and we learned a lot from it. But it's the weird things you don't think of that always get you. And so we have to always be vigilant to, to keep our crew and our people safe. And uh, so that's what I have. Oh, and one last thing. If you ever find yourself in Florida for whatever reason, going to the beaches, going to the theme parks, um, and if it's open after COVID, absolutely plan to spend a day at the Caribbean Space Center. Absolutely. You can spend an entire eight hours there. They have tons of museums. They have bus tours. You can go up into, you can see the, the vehicle assembly building. You can see the launch pads you went to the moon with. They have a Saturn V. I mean, they have absolutely tons to do. Easily fill eight hours there. Um, it's not just one same big building, it's like almost like a, a park of, of buildings and museums and IMAX theaters. And, uh, it's a very, very cool place. Uh, that's what kept me going when I was having some trouble in undergraduate. I would, I would take a trip up to the Kennedy Space Center uh, to remind myself of why I was doing what I was doing. And I uh, highly, highly recommend it. And so that's all I've got. So if, if I want to hand it back to, to Drew here to uh, field any questions you might have. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Pete. This is, was great. I have to um, uh, say, I, 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 a few years ago, I was down at uh, Kennedy with, uh, with my family, and uh, we went to the, the Kennedy Space Flight Center. And um, when you get into this one building where they actually have, I'm, I'm trying to remember whether it was Atlantis or Discovery, uh, the shuttle that's there, they actually had two retired uh, engineers that would act as docents. And um, so we started talking to them, and he had a little a little iPad, and we probably talked to him for 45 minutes, and he was showing us uh, pictures of of, uh, of the inside of the of the crew cabin. It was just outstanding, and they just loved loved talking about it. So it's a it was a great uh, a great thing. So um, okay, we we do have um, uh, Phil uh, from the live stream asks, does the trench still exist? Uh, the same as a part of the program as uh, at Mission Control, and is there uh, a duplicate working Mission Control, a floor above or below? Uh, so the trench, I'm only vaguely familiar with what that is. I believe the trench refers to the way, so the, the Apollo Mission Control is laid out in like a tiered system, so everybody everybody behind you is higher up, almost like a movie theater. And I, think, I think the trench refers to a particular row. So in that sense, it doesn't, because we all sit on level floors today. And if, and if I don't know what the trench is, I apologize. Um, but yes, the, uh, the mission control, the Apollo mission control is literally right above the current 
space station mission control. That that pillar labeled H14 that I bang my chair into all the time because it's right behind me goes right through the floor up into the Apollo mission control. We sit right below it. And then we have several other mission control rooms um, that we use for the space shuttle or that we use as backups or that we use for training or that we use for like Orion and Gateway when they're ready to fly. Okay, very good. Do we have any, any questions here um, uh, here in person? If so, I'll, um, oh, we got one, one in the back. So maybe I'm going to date myself. I'm going to do my Phil Donahue thing. If we're interested in working for NASA, what way, what steps could we take to get there, and what kind of classes might someone consider to take? Did, did you hear that? I did, and that's an excellent question. Um, so the first thing I'll say is to be tenacious. Um, my undergraduate grades left much to be desired, but I did not give up. Uh, so don't do, don't do it the way I did it. <laughs> um, study, and it sounds cliche, study science, engineering, and math. Uh, get an engineering degree uh, or get a science degree. You don't have to be a doctor or a master's. Like a lot of the people, at least for mission control, they hire are straight out of college bachelor's degrees because they don't want any preconceived notions and they want to ingrain our safety culture into them. So they don't want someone coming in who's not going to change and bend and flex and fit nicely into the, the program. Um, they want someone who's, who's young and, and interested in starting, starting anew. Uh, study science, engineering, uh, math. I will say that quote unquote technology degrees can sometimes be disqualifying, so be careful with that. Um, also, do a lot of cool extracurricular stuff. So, like when I was in high school, um, I was president of the astronomy club and I hosted observing nights in my backyard. I hope you guys can, can go enjoy the skies out there. Some of the most beautiful I've ever seen are up there in the southern tier. Um, after I was hired, I actually did a, a fake Mars mission out in Utah Desert at the Mars Desert Research Station, not affiliated with NASA, but it was something fun. Um, but if you aren't working at NASA and you do stuff like that and put it on your resume, it shows a personal interest in it. Uh, the other thing to remind yourself is that um, NASA is not necessarily the only game in town anymore. Uh, there are a lot of other small private companies, big, large, small startups. And... Um, there's also multiple places to work. Like I'm down in Texas, but they launch out of Florida. And then Goddard does all the space, the Earth science stuff. And then they do all the Mars rover stuff out in California. So um, it depends what you want to do, but definitely study engineering or science and, and be tenacious. Because a lot of people are going to tell you no, but if you just keep at it and, and make almost a lifestyle out of it um, and be more than just a name on a piece of paper, you, you probably will be able to do great things. An another way to do that, uh that didn't put on your resume is, is to be a, a, a Copernic intern. And I say that yeah, because, no, seriously, yeah. because <laughs> there was an actual Copernic intern who asked the question. <laughs> so <laughs> you're well on your way. Well, it sounds like you're doing the right thing already. This is exactly, this is exactly what, what you should be doing. Is you got to intern at these cool places where you can inspire other people and do stuff beyond just doing well on the tests, which is something I didn't do. Right, well, uh, I did very well, And <laughs> very poorly. <laughs> and on uh, YouTube chat asks, why do we have to go to the moon before we go to Mars? So the whole point of that is to test it. And that's a good question. And a lot of people have asked that too. Elon Musk has his sites up on Mars. A lot of people want to go to Mars. Uh, Buzz Aldrin wants to go to Mars. Um, of course, Buzz Aldrin has the benefit of having ever been to the moon. Um, but the, the idea of it is that we've got to figure it out. We don't know what we don't know. It's like we started with Alan Shepard going up and down, 15-minute flight. And then we started going into orbit. You know, so you practice, you iterate step by step by step and you learn everything along the way. Now we've got the space station. People have been living on the space station since the year 2000, right? Not the same person. But it has constantly had somebody on board. So if you were born after the year 2000, in your lifetime, not every person who exists has ever been on Earth at the same time. And you learn these things. But the space station is only like, if you have an emergency, you get your spacecraft and you come home, and you're home in like four hours. So like, if you have like a toothache, or you know, you have appendicitis, or you, you smash your head and need stitches, you can come home. Well, Mars is a six month trip, so don't hurt yourself. And if you do, you have to fix it on your own. Uh, the moon is three days away, and so the idea is that we can take baby steps to get farther and farther away from home, and get a little bit more self-sufficient, like a kid going to college, right? Maybe they come home for the summer, for the first two years before they stay and, and do their own thing. 
um, you want to build up to it so that you don't kill anybody and so that you learn you learn how to make mistakes and fix them before your life depends on it. All right, thank you. Another uh, question from the chat. Tia asks, or, or comments, it says, I think you met our UAE first astronauts before their journey, right? Yes. Uh, I don't remember if I met him personally. Uh, I'm trying to think what increment he went up in. So, so the space station we do six month increments, which is basically one person from each team is quote unquote in charge of organizing the mission. And my mission started with a Soyuz failure and my crew falling out of the sky. Uh, so I'm trying to think, I think the UAE astronauts went up after that, um, but this is exactly what I'm talking about with bringing in new cultures and countries. Uh, you never know what you're going to learn from them, and the more people who are involved, the more outreach they can do, and the more united humanity becomes. All right, very good. Uh, any other questions here? Uh, we have another question here. Can, can you put the uh, picture of New York City from the space shuttle back up? Certainly. So, do you have a question about it, or? No, I just, I, I just want to take a picture of it so I can show it <laughs> to some friends who live there. Oh, certainly. Uh, let me get that up for you here. Uh, also, I, I have it uh, here as well, so uh, I could, you know, after afterwards I could put it up as well. But uh, uh, I think if, if you got it, got go it. ahead and let's do yeah, it. Yeah, I got it here. Boom. There you go. And so, I mean, you can see the roads, and, and all those little kind of like bumpy looking things on the roads, they're either streetlights or cars. So don't let anybody ever tell you the only thing you can see from space is the Great Wall of China. Uh, you can see a lot of things from space. And you can see uh, Times Square is the part in the middle that's super bright. Uh, you can see boats in the channel. You can see cars and the footpaths in Central Park. All right, the city. I have another question here. Um, so you talked about uh, maybe living on the moon, I guess, like at one point. So how would we be able to like sustain there if we don't have like the resources that we have on Earth? Excellent question. Uh, so it will start out with us being dependent on Earth. It absolutely will. Uh, but eventually, you could start doing things like growing your own food uh, using hydroponics or dirt that you brought with you. Um, I don't think you could grow plants in the lunar soil, assuming, of course, you covered them and they're not just in the natural space. But it will start with we are dependent on Earth. But slowly, piece by piece, maybe the astronauts start growing their own food. And then there's already technologies where you could actually build buildings with the lunar dust. You could actually turn it into concrete. Um, and then we have 3D printers on the International Space Station. So we send up the raw material, and then if the crew needs to build something, they just print it out. So you could, you could have some 3D printers on the moon with the material. And then if you need a part, you just make it yourself. Eventually, I mean like eventually, you could get to the point where you could mine the moon and have industry and be self-sufficient. But for a long time leading into that, you still need the raw materials from Earth, but you can start utilizing them and making them, shaping them on your own. Just like you know when, when North America was, was first colonized um, by Europeans, um, you know, granted, there are already people here who get along just fine, um, but the Europeans sent supplies over until eventually they didn't have to anymore. All right, thanks. Uh, any other questions? Oh, okay. Getting my steps in tonight. That's great. Thanks. So, note I was noticing here <clears throat> that a lot of these mission controls are kind of in the southern half of the U.S. Mostly, is there a reason for the, you know why they're around that latitude? Yes, um, President Johnson. <laughs> um, so uh, basically, um, we ended up in Texas because that's where Johnson was from, and he was a vice president. Um, so Kennedy, I think, was assassinated in was it '63, which yeah. is right about the same time that the mission control is moving. So it started out we actually had tiny little mission control buildings at the launch pads themselves in Florida, but we outgrew that. And so politics dictated that it ended up in Texas because that's where the guy who was making the decision was from. The 
reason given was that it was halfway between both coasts, so you could you know, get to either side of the country if you needed to. We already had some facilities on the other side of the country as well, so right in the middle. Um, it was near the water, so you could ship giant items in if you needed. Of course, we've never had to do that. Um, and so I think what you'll find, and that's for Texas, uh, Florida is just where it is. So the, the closer you are to the equator, the faster you're spinning on Earth. And basically, if you put your launch site farther south, you get that little kick from the spin of the Earth, so you don't need quite as much fuel. So that's why that's there. Um, and, and also, I believe that's mm -hmm. right, the ESA uses their launch facility in French Guiana, which is yes. very, very close to the equator. Yep. And there was a company, I think they're defunct now, called Sea Launch, which would actually launch your, your cargo on a rocket from a barge that would park on the equator. So that's, that's like Kennedy and, and Johnson. Um, Goddard is in Maryland, which depending on where you're from is southern or not. I don't consider it southern. A lot of people do. Um, California has um, has a few. There just happen to be near big population centers. And then there's uh, facilities along the Gulf Coast. There's Stennis and Huntsville. Um, I don't know why Huntsville is where it is. I think it has to do with there's a military base that happens to be there. And then Stennis is where they build some of these rockets, and that's along the Gulf Coast, so you can ship them out. Um, that being said, the space shuttle rocket boosters and the rocket boosters that are going to be used for a moon rocket come out of Utah, and they ship them by train. Um, and I think United Launch Alliance has their mission control facility in Colorado. Um, so you're starting, to, you're starting to see a little diversification. And of course, Moscow's far north. And... Um, the East emission controls in Germany, which is pretty far north. All right, we've got a, another question, uh, maybe a little outside of your comfort zone, but uh, we'll throw it out. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Fred asks, how will radiation be handled in the living area? I'm assuming either on Gateway or perhaps even on the moon. Uh, so actually not, not out of my uh, comfort zone. I apologize. Right. Um, that's a good question. So we will have shielding um, in the vehicle itself. Um, all spacecraft are shielded. Uh, it's not such a big deal on the International Space Station because you're still within the Earth's magnetic sphere, and so the, the magnetism of the Earth kind of deflects all the charged particles away from you. Um, but they will be exposed to radiation, and essentially, you just mitigate it. So you keep track of how much radiation an astronaut gets, and that will determine how many missions they get to go on, so as not to increase their cancer risk. Yeah. I, again, I think they would, you know, Fred actually updated and said specifically, I guess, the moon living area. So I guess they would be looking to uh, try to hard, radiation harden those facilities. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if, funnily enough, there's actually less radiation on the surface of the moon than there is in orbit. Because if you're on the surface, you've got a whole planet blocking half of the sky and all the weird stuff that's trying to get to you. But if you're in orbit, you're fair game from all, all angles. So um, if you're on the surface of the moon or Mars, you'll actually be exposed to less radiation than if you're in orbit around the moon or Mars. But it's still higher than what you experience here on Earth due to our strong magnetic field. Right. Maybe, and, and honestly, that's like one of the biggest questions just in general is, okay, how sure. do we deal with this? So it's an ongoing thing. All right, any other questions? Jumping out of here. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, we've had a number of people... Uh, uh, comment on the uh, chat that they really enjoyed your, your presentation and uh, Thank you. so thanks again it's uh, great to sort of get that inside uh, inside view I uh, really appreciate uh, your time um, Thank you. and uh, look forward to uh, inviting you back uh, back up uh, when you're when you're back up into the area and um, and, and I thank you all so uh, uh, we all The uh, skies were relatively decent earlier on. They are less decent now, but certainly worth uh, going outside. So uh, we've got some scopes as soon as you walk outside, uh, but also uh, when you go through the double doors and to the left, uh, going to the observatory, the six-inch scope uh, was on Jupiter. The, the red inch scope, uh, the, uh, the, that's on the left-hand side. Our 14-inch 14, 14 scope on the right-hand side uh, was uh, looking at Saturn. But... Um, Hopefully we get some uh, little, as we call them, sucker holes to open up the sky, sky for us and get a, uh, a look 
before you leave. That's that's the rule here is you cannot leave Copernic until you look through a telescope. So I'll, I'll chase you down in the parking lot. All right, well, thanks again, Peter. Uh, have a great weekend. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the work you do. It's an honor. Take care. Have a bye, guys.